Hello and welcome into the Fog.net podcast. My name is Michael Swain, the Kansas beat writer for 24-7 Sports. Joined today by McLean Baxley, who covers Oklahoma State for 24-7 Sports. We're going to dive into this weekend's KU versus Oklahoma State matchup. It's set for a 2.30 kick down in Stillwater. It's going to be televised on Fox Sports 1. Um, this is, I, I think for me, a, a really interesting game for both teams. You know, KU enters trying to clinch ball eligibility for back-to-back seasons for the first time, or f- first time since 2007, second time ever. And Oklahoma State's trying to continue their upward trend after a, a big win over Kansas State. But McLean, I know this is your your first season getting the full experience of covering Oklahoma State football, at least. What's it been like so far in it? For what feels like from afar, it's been a very interesting start to the season. Up close, it's been an interesting start. You know, they they had you know a couple of close wins there to open the season against Central Arkansas, and then on the road at Arizona State, and then they got blown out at home by South Alabama, and uh, that was a game that is it's the worst loss of the Gundy era, one of the worst losses in um, Oklahoma State program history, thirty three to seven at home mm-hmm. uh, again to a Sun Belt team, and then the next week they go to Ames. Uh, and lose to Iowa State in a game that the score looked closer than the game actually was. I think Iowa State kind of controlled that game for much of the afternoon, and the game ended on an album and interception uh, in the fourth quarter. So uh, then they took a bye, and then, like you said, last week against uh, Kansas State at home on a Friday night, sold-out game, blackout, and uh, they controlled that game for you know all 60 minutes, really. I mean, there was a couple of big plays that they allowed uh, – Kansas State to go open and, you know, Will Howard had a big 70 yard run there to kind of uh, keep him close. But I mean, it was a game that the offense looked good. The defense, you know, had three takeaways, uh, two of them by a freshman. And so the, the season's been very interesting and uh, some new faces and some, some, they seem like they're kind of rounding into form uh, as we enter uh, the midway point of the season. Yeah. So I'm curious, let's start here. You know, Oklahoma State fans have come accustomed to winning football. Right. They've done it very consistently under Mike Gundy. Right. I think there's the streak of consecutive bowl games. Um, and it felt like after week three, at least that that might be under threat. But just what's the the mood been like around the fan base as kind of the season has unfolded, I guess, kind of up until this point, because I feel like they probably can't have been happy of the way things started. Absolutely. I mean, around fans, media, probably around the team as well after that. South Alabama lost, you know, they're, they're staring at, uh, you know, they're two and one and they go to Ames or two and two. That doesn't happen. Uh, and still, like you said, you know, Mike Gundy, since he's been here, 17 straight bowl uh, appearances. Um, his, his lone losing season was his first season uh, as head coach. And so that just doesn't happen where, where you're in mediocrity. Uh, they're used to winning, winning games. And so uh, after, you know, going to the bye week, it was a long two weeks of, uh, a lot of people talking about they're two and two. They've lost back to back games. They one of those goes to a Sun Belt team. Uh, morale is very low, and uh, optimism was was kind of rare. But then they come out last week, and now they're three and two. You know, there's at least three winnable games on the rest of their season on the rest of their schedule, and, and perhaps even more. You know, there, there's talks of you know if they run the table, they they can make the Big Twelve championship game uh, in Arlington the first week of December, and even even if that's still. Um, out of the question, you know, there's still four or five games that, that should be pretty winnable and keeping that bowl streak in, intact and yeah. getting some good home wins against some of the newcomers to the Big 12 while also still, you know, perhaps performing against uh, Kansas and Oklahoma at home. Um, so I think the overall vibe is more positive now than it was two or three weeks ago. Um, and that, that it's crazy how that one game can really change the tone uh, in and around a program. Yeah, I feel like. For folks that didn't watch the 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 K State Oklahoma State game, I mean, it was one where K State looked very flat footed, but Oklahoma State just came out. I thought and and wanted it more, right? I think you saw the the desire, and obviously the defense for Oklahoma State did play well. I want to go here because I think if you watched Oklahoma State to start the season, there was the quarterback rotation. Um, the defense didn't necessarily look great. And then they come out and Alan Bowman has a decent game against K-State. The defense looks a lot better. What stood out to you the last time you saw Oklahoma State in Ames before the bye week? And then what was the big difference that you saw from the team against K-State? And do you think that's sustainable going into this week against KU and maybe even looking ahead? 
So on offense, you mentioned Allen Bowman in the rotation. So against Iowa State, that was his first game playing a full game. You know, the first three mm-hmm. games they're rotating uh, between three quarterbacks every four series. And so that was the first opportunity to play a full four-quarter game, you know, after turnovers, after touchdowns. Bowman knew he was going to go back onto the field next time they had the ball. And that was really good to get, you know, offensive rhythm. He, that was the first time we, the first time we talked to him was after the game. Um, and he talked about how it was huge for him to – get rhythm and, and, Mm. you know, not worry about, you know, if if they have to punt, that's not the end of the world, you know, whereas in those first three games, if they punted, you only have one more drive, two more drives to go out and prove yourself. And so he had a full game to work with and he got comfortable, but unfortunately for Oklahoma state, the first game that he was able to do that was game four against a conference team. So, you know, there was some throws that were behind receivers. The uh, offense line Mm. still wasn't great Uh, against a pretty good, you know, Iowa state defense, you know, that's what they're known for with Matt Campbell and his defense, but um, it definitely it's it looked like it was his first game playing a full game. Two weeks later, he's now had two full weeks as the guy. You know, he's taken the majority of reps in practice. He's working with the first team uh, linemen, first team receivers, first team running backs, and, and really gaining a grasp of the offense and uh, you know, building chemistry with receivers, with running backs, and uh, command you know commanding the offense. And it showed. You know, he came out there that first drive. 75 yard, you know, 15 play drive where they just went down the field and didn't have any negative plays. Really didn't have any negative plays all all night. You know, there's there's no sacks, a couple you know runs for losses, but you know he's able to throw the ball away, not take sacks, and move the move the ball forward, which it helped them against the Kansas State defense, especially that front, uh, you know, that, that defensive line that that's caused problems for a lot of teams this season. So on offense, you know, just having another week to you know really master that offense and, and really get comfortable doing what he's doing with, with the guys around him. And then on defense, you know, this is the first year of Brian Nardo as the uh, defensive coordinator at Oklahoma state. He brings us three, three, five and preseason. A lot of the players were saying how they felt comfortable with it, you know, in spring practice and spring meetings, they, they uh, learned it and got comfortable doing it. But then once you see it in the game, it's totally different than when you're going against it in practice. And so in central Arkansas, they had issues like, with tackling and that kind of trans, you know, uh, went into Arizona State as well. And then mm-hmm. against uh, South Alabama, they just could not stop the run at all. You know, South Alabama ran for 200-plus yards on them. And then Iowa State, the, the, they fixed the running defense, but then the uh, secondary and the uh, in coverage was really a struggle. And then against, like you said, against K-State, they kind of fixed all of that. They, they were able to tackle. They were able to you know, defend the run. They were able to stop in the secondary with a younger secondary. So they kind of put it all together, and I expect – with another week of practice and another week of seeing things that went well and also seeing things that didn't do well uh, will be a big sign for them in, in going to KU. Yeah, I want to talk about Bowman a little bit and then we can transition into the defense. Some, you know, he's someone that's been around for, he's one of these guys that with the new, that with the COVID rules that you forget how long they've been around. And he's someone that's been around since the 2018 season. Like for KU fans, like think back to David Beatty's last year as head coach that's how long alan bowman has been in college for and he's been around right was at texas tech went to michigan now is spending his final college season at oklahoma state what exactly did he do to win the job right because you're looking at you know garrett wrangle um started the game between ku and oklahoma state last year obviously there's gunner gundy there as well what did bowman do to win the job and i guess his skill set just what do you feel like he is offering to this offense so he's seen a lot of football, like you said. You know, those mm-hmm. two other guys are a freshman or redshirt freshman. Um, they they haven't played. You know, when he was at Texas Tech, he became a starter for for two seasons there before dealing with injuries and then opting to transfer where he, where he was a backup at Michigan. But just being around, you know, quarterback rooms around Cliff Kingsbury there in Texas Tech, where they're you know throwing it a hundred times a game, and then going to Michigan where you know, they were a playoff team last year. You're around that you know offense. You're around those people that you're you're seeing defenses. You're seeing you know Ohio State, Iowa. Penn State defenses, you know, and preparing for those. Um, and even even if he's not playing, he's seeing it and learning the game. And then you take him to Oklahoma State, where you know they, they kind of built the offense around him. He talked about uh, last week, and I you know wrote a story about it. You know his relationship with Casey Dunn, offensive coordinator, and they kind of molded this the offense. And, and he really fit, you know, being able to throw it, you know, down the field and, and throw it often, while also being able to hand off and, and kind of rely on that run game to get started, so the so the um, passing game opens up. And just having the maturity of being able to read defenses, knowing when to throw it away. I know some Oklahoma State fans get frustrated when he is throwing it away so often, but I, I always, you know, kind of laugh. I mean, would you rather would you rather those be sacks? Would you rather those be tackles for loss? Or would you rather just be second and ten versus second and eighteen? 
Mm. Um, so he, he, he has game management skills and knows how to do that. You know, like up in Iowa state, you know, he had about two minute drive, um, to go tie the game. And, you know, unfortunately for him, he, he did throw an interception on a bad throw, but, uh, knowing that he could go in there and, you know, step up to the plate to, to go potentially lead his team to a, to a tie on the road, uh, what was big and something that definitely proved himself uh, that he was able to do. Um, so I think the maturity thing was the biggest factor. He's got a good arm. He's, he's able to extend plays. He's not known as a runner. I think, you know, Gundy is probably the better, the, the better runner of the three, but he was able to extend plays you know, against Iowa State. He had a 12 yard touchdown run. He, he you know, had a big pickup last week against K state. So being, being able to you know, game manage and really, uh, do what he needs to, to to keep his team afloat and, and keep the ball moving forward was, was a big factor in, in him getting the starting role. Mm, and so obviously, right, with Casey Dunn, the offensive coordinator, he's been around for a while. What exactly are they trying to get accomplished on offense? You know, KU's coming off of a game where it was an up-tempo team trying to run the ball a lot. You go the week prior, right, Texas, explosive, great playmakers on the outside walk us through kind of what this Oklahoma state offense is trying to be this season and where kind of maybe some of those strengths or weaknesses might lie. They've talked about wanting to be a balanced team. They want to be able to run the ball to set up a pass, which is something that you learn in freshman year of high school that you want to do. You know, it's, it's not a, it's not a, you know, revolutionary thought from my mm-hmm. gun Casey Dunn to be able to do that, but they, 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 they want to rely on their run game. Uh, behind Ollie Gordon, behind Elijah Collins, behind Jaden Nixon, and behind this offensive line that until last Friday was really bad. I mean, they they struggled in those first three games, uh, for, first four games really, to uh, getting kind of push and create holes for their running backs last week. And really, I'm being too harsh. Against Iowa State, they, they did look better. Um, with di- moving six – there's they're using about six offensive linemen uh, in different ways around the – you know, in different positions and um, – they really want to rely on their running game and get that established so that uh, the linebackers crash down and give the give the receivers uh, yeah. opportunity to make plays. And they've got the quarterback that can make those plays. You know, we saw last week some more slants and converting those slants, you know, 10, 20 yards down the field, uh, not relying on the big long shot ball uh, on third and 12, you know. So uh, they don't, I think they want to be a run first team uh, while still understanding that they have a good quarterback that they trust. They got some pretty decent receivers on the outside, some experienced receivers uh, on both sides on both sides of the quarterback. So um, I think you know relying on Ollie Gordon and relying on that offensive line to get a push and to stay ahead of the chains uh, is something that they want to do first for sure. Yeah, I'll switch to defense. I was listening to Mike Gundy on his weekly press conference Monday. Long week, McLean. I, I'm forgetting what day it is now. Uh, I was listening to it on Monday, and something you mentioned that it may have been just like a, a little throwaway comment, but he was talking about how young they are in the secondary and how they've got young players who aren't super experienced also trying to learn a defense that they weren't running last year. What have you seen from the secondary? Because when I look at Kansas' offense, right, I think week in and week out, KU puts the most pressure on safeties than I think probably any team in the conference with what they do in the the run game with the option plays and then the deep balls over the top. Like for me, I look at that position group and say, if they're young, that could be a an area for KU to exploit. So, uh, you know, what have you seen from that group? And maybe I guess would you just agree with Gundy's sentiment about the the corners and safeties so far? They're definitely young, you know, on paper. Um, you know, there's mm-hmm. a lot of redshirt freshmen, redshirt sophomores, you know, second, third year guys. Um, being expected to go out there and play. And, you know, I think one of the biggest wins of the past couple, maybe of the season for Oklahoma State, Lyric Rawls, he's a, a senior safety or senior defense. It's, it's interesting because the 3 3 5, they all kind of play everywhere in the backfield. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. But uh, senior defensive back, Lyric Rawls goes down. We didn't, we didn't he, he was not available for Iowa State. We knew that. And so they, had, they let Cameron Epps, a redshirt freshman, go out there and make the start against mm-hmm. Iowa State, and he got picked on hard. I mean, there was a, he, he, you know, the pro football focus, he graded horribly. He was picked on, you know, which most offensive coordinators would do. They would attack the young guy, the, the inexperienced guy that they don't have any film on. Two weeks later, he has two interceptions, one of them is a pick six, and mm-hmm. he grades one of the highest uh, on this team um, in, a, in an overall pretty defensive game um, against K-State. So, He's come along great, and uh, you know there's there's several other guys along the line. What and you also have Kendall Daniels, you know, who was former 
uh, you know, Big 12 freshman of the year, can play everywhere. He, he kind of plays down to the linebacker um, position more so than now than, than playing deep in the field. But mm-hmm. they are a very young secondary, and that's something that, you know, if, if I'm an offensive coordinator, I'm trying to exploit until they prove that they can stop it. Obviously, K-State, you know, was doing that, and they did stop it. You know, they had yeah. – there were no big plays uh, in the passing game. Um, and they were able to get, you know, two interceptions, and linebacker Nick Martin got a uh, fumble. But or he had an interception as well. Um, but uh, yeah, I would tag that secondary because that's that's where the youth is. You know, the, all the all the experience is up front. You know, they've got a bunch of seniors, redshirt seniors, uh, there on the defensive line and, and at the linebacker position um, that kind of plays down. So the the, yeah. the definitely weakest part is that secondary. Yeah, and I, I wanted to talk about the kind of the the front six now. Um, you know, last year in this game, Oklahoma State was really banged up. They're I think they're missing three, maybe starters along the defensive line. And now I look at that group and watching them play K state. Like I thought the linebackers were awesome. Um, I think Oliver is his last name. Like he thought he was really, really good. And it's a front six that I wonder if they're going to be able to have some success against KU where KU has struggled against these kind of three, three, five teams, right? Iowa state is a team that has played K really well. You know, in their two games, they've played against them. Baylor did really well against KU last season with that 3-3-5 look as well. What has stood out to you most then, right? It's a, a maybe a bit of a different scheme that they're making them run up there up front, but I guess what have you kind of thought of the way that they've played through the first part of the season? And I, are there any like, I don't know about weaknesses, but what do you feel like are kind of the, the pros and cons of what that group is offering right now? I think the biggest key to their success has been their rotation. Um, you know, in those first two or three games of the season, Gundy talked about how because they had so many new guys from the portal and new guys from recruiting that they were going to be trying a lot of guys. You know, I think 60, 70 players played in those first two games uh, at Arizona State and against uh, Central Arkansas, both on offense and defense. And mm-hmm. that was more so on the defensive side. I mean, these guys are rotating every couple of plays, especially on the defensive line. You know, Justin Kirkland, he's a huge – you know, 300 something pound. I mean, I, saying they're talking to him. I mean, I'm like, are you, are you real? I mean, you're a big man, <laughs> but he, he'll go in there for like two or three plays cause having, he's not, he's not a guy to get in the backfield and make a sack, but he's a guy that requires a double team from an offensive mm-hmm. lineman. So, so there, so his teammate can go around get in the backfield. He'll go out there for two or three plays and then slowly jog off and kill that time. And so another guy can go in. I mean, they've, they've been using that, um, kind of the uh, substitution rules where the yeah. team has to have a, opportunity to sub as the offense does and they've been using that really well uh that kind of threw fits against iowa state uh they're in the second half especially but rotating guys they've got depth uh at defensive line and that none of the guys are, are going to be you know getting first team all american votes but they're all good enough to where they can compete and it's not a huge drop off when you do have to sub when you do have to rotate guys whether yeah. for uh you know, injury if it happens or if it's just, you know, regular getting tired and, and subbing off, um, you know, every couple of plays. And that's been the biggest key. I mean, Nathan Latou has come in and really just stunned uh, coming off the defensive end. Uh, Cody walter has been fine. Uh, and then Anthony Goodlow, a transfer from Tulsa, has been, yeah. has been dominant. I mean, he is he, he another – he's he's taller. He's not as, like, big as uh, Kirkland, but he's just a tall dude, like, talking to him. And, and he, he just likes going out there and playing, like, old school football and – He's going to do everything he can to get in that backfield. Um, he's done a pretty good job of that. And like you said, Colin Oliver, uh, you know, should get you know first team Big Twelve votes again, and and you know be, be a he he'll wreck havoc. I mean, he's listed as linebacker. He's definitely more comfortable playing on that defensive end uh, position, kind of you know rover position coming down. But he's just so good and so fun to watch. Um, yeah. and, all, and all those guys are just kind of feed off each other, and really, I think that plays to their both experience uh, as they are most of them are definitely older, but also just the comfortability in, in Nardo's defense and him just giving them the permission to just go and, and do what they need to, to get to the quarterback, get to the backfield, stop the run. I love that you mentioned that about the defensive line rotating slowly, because that's something that KU has made a, a trademark of its defensive line. I think really over the last two years or last year, especially like guys were trudging on and off the field, taking up as much time as possible You've seen some of that a little bit this year. I think against UCF, you saw it some more, but that's that's interesting. And good load too. That was someone that KU showed some interest in as a defensive tackle, um, and it seems like he's done a really good job at, at Oklahoma State so far. Let's get to special teams real quick, and then I've got one more question for you. Um, 
I always say you can't, you don't want to lose games on special teams and KU lost games on special teams last year for KU special teams have been a, a strength this year. Punter Damon Greaves has been good outside of one missed field goal last week. Seth Keller has been good. Oklahoma state though. How are their special teams units looking and what have you thought of those groups so far? Alex Hill is the uh, reigning, um, not Ray guy, Lou Groza, uh, player of the week um, for his five converted field goals last week. And he missed one. It was blocked, but it was not his fault. It's a blocking issue. Mm. He's been very good. And, you know, again, he's an older guy. He's a guy that, you know, was getting Lou Groza, uh, you know, speculation and, and hype, you know, in 2021 and then had an injury that ended the season prematurely and then was out for most of last season also. He's solid. He's a guy that Gundy has said he can. He he, feel, he feels comfortable throwing him out there, fifty-seven in. So you know that's that's a good thing. Um, they haven't, you know, when they punt, it's been good. Nothing to write home about. But then you know, on the defensive side, they they've had several blocks. You know, in the first game of the season, um, you know, Kobe hmm. Black was able to get around and got two blocks: one on a field goal, one on an extra point uh, against Central Arkansas. Um, again, at Central Arkansas, it's an FCS team. Yet he hasn't done that against you know the, the big boys but still being able to get around there get having the speed and having the timing to get there is, is crucial um mm-hmm. and so i think special teams are very good and, and you know gundy talks about a lot how they don't they don't have a special teams coach um they got an analyst and i'm sure you know different coaches kind of talk to them i know for a fact that you know their, their linebackers coaches do a lot on the on the blocking um they're on the you know on defense of side mm-hmm. of special teams but uh to have, to have that much success without having a specific guy has been pretty impressive to see. And especially Alex Hale, mm-hmm. who uh, would, would, would be really cool if he does, wh- whether he wins Lou Groza or just gets, you know, invited to the ceremony, I think would be a really cool uh, special ending to a, to a career that he has you know, had up and down. He's had injuries. He's gotten you know, passed over and, and from you know, other guys, but definitely a, would be a cool uh, ending for a guy that's, you know, similar. I think, I think he's 24, 25 as well. Uh, up there with Bowman. I love it. Let's get I got one more question for you here. I thought the betting spread for this game was really interesting. Three three points, three and a half. I've got it here. It sits at three as, as on Thursday. Um, money line minus 155 to Kansas. What do you think of that? Oklahoma State is a home underdog. I don't know what they are all time against that, but I feel like that's not a spot Oklahoma State has been in a lot under Mike Gundy. But three points, do you think that's that's fair? Too lenient one way or the other? So it's not been a big thing uh, a lot, but I know Mike Gundy is nine and zero as a home underdog. Um, and re- I don't know what how mm. what that time span is, but Brett Murphy after they won as a home underdog last week against K State tweeted it out, and uh, Gundy he, he'll never say it, but he loves being an underdog. He loves playing against a ranked team, especially at home. Uh, it's gonna be another sellout game. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you know three points is almost a coin flip, really. I mean, that's one field goal. That's one. Missed tackle. That's one interception. Um, so I think that's uh, it's 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 gonna be a close game. Um, especially you know, regardless of who plays quarterback, they're kind of preparing for Bean to be the guy, and, and their defense um, has had another week, like I said, to, to prepare, and the offense has another another week to get comfortable and you know watch film and watch what worked against K State, watch what worked against you know Iowa State, and uh, yeah, I mean it should be a fun fun atmosphere on a, on a Saturday afternoon. Um, like I said, it's another sellout game. Oklahoma State's fans have been very good this year, uh, aside from the South Alabama game. Um, they against Central Arkansas and uh, Kansas State. They've been very good and, and raucous and uh, sold out. So it should be a cool atmosphere on Saturday for sure. Love it. Well, I'm looking forward to heading down to Stillwater to take this one in and, and cover it. And I'm sure we'll see you there, McLean. But thanks a bunch for jumping on the podcast. For folks that want to check out all your work, where can they find you? You can find it at gopokes.com or on Twitter at McLean Baxley, at McLean Baxley. Very awesome. original Thanks. name on Twitter. <laughs> I love it. I, hey, you haven't put the 247 at the end of it like I have. I sold out. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, McLean. Appreciate it. Appreciate it.